Welcome to another episode of the Go To Book Club. My name is Stefan Hofer. I am a consultant and coach, and I model domains, business processes, and software architecture using different notations and diagramming techniques. I have also written a book about one, Domain Storytelling, and I had the pleasure of being interviewed for this channel. Today, I am the interviewer, and I could not have asked for a better book to discuss. Today, we are going to discuss creating software with modern diagramming techniques, build better software with Mermaid. The author is Ashley Peacock. Ashley, welcome to the GoTo Book Club. Do you want to introduce yourself to our viewers? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Ashley Peacock. I, um, I live in the UK. I'm a staff level software engineer for uh, a UK insurance company. Um, I've been diagramming for a very long time. And as Stefan said, I, uh, I wrote a book all about it called Creating Software with Modern Diagramming Techniques. Awesome. So let's talk about diagrams and, and, and not just drawing diagrams by hand, which is probably the, the most natural way to approach diagramming, but also diagrams as code. That is a concept that I believe has become quite popular in the last couple of years. And you built your book around this, this concept or the notation, the tooling you use is built around that. Can you give us an introduction to diagramming as code for someone who is not familiar with that concept yet? Sure. So historically, if you wanted to draw a diagram, you might reach for a tool like Visio or more modern ones such as you know, draw.io, diagrams.net is really popular these days. Um, and you essentially use the UI to draw boxes, lines, label the lines and so forth. The, that works well. So if you're, if you're just getting started, but it has problems for one, it's, it's, it can be a little slow. Um, but the other kind of problem comes from the fact that it's not, it's not machine readable. So if you ever look at the format that that, that diagram is, is saved in, it's, it's, you won't be able to read it, right? No, no one can, you can't diff it. You can't version control it. Um, so what diagrams as code does is it allows you to write your diagrams. Um, as you would write HTML, for example. Um, so you, yeah, there's simple markup and it takes that markup and converts it into an image is that effectively, um, is, is the simple way to put it. Mm -hmm. And do you still have control over the layout then, or is that completely generated by the tooling? So it depends which tooling you, you use. Um, in some, you have more control than others. So. A really kind of modern one is called D3, um, and that gives you a lot of control over the layout, but it's, it's more similar to writing code than it is diagrams as code. It's still diagrams as code, but it's more like writing, you know, Java or, or C sharp. Um, with tools like Mermaid, for example, um, the notation is, is super simple and you do have some control over the layout. Um, but perhaps not as much as you, you might like. You might, you kind of have to have a, an acceptance that it might not look as pretty as if you drew it by hand, but that's the, the trade-off you, you make for having ease of creating the diagram and, you know, version control and all these things. So I guess it's like most things in software engineering, it's a, it's a, a trade-off. Yeah. So less control, but less, you know, moving stuff or pixel to the left or to the right. So that's then one of the advantages if, if it's generated, right? Yes. Um, one of the other benefits being you can also, you know, you can store this. So, um, and by store, I mean, if you're drawing, if you're storing on draw.io, for example, um, it's, it's stuck in draw.io. So if, if me and you work together and you leave the company and go somewhere else and it's on your draw.io account and you leave, suddenly we no longer have access to, uh, to that diagram. Perhaps it's quite common for companies to kind of wipe people's Google's account and so forth. Um, whereas if you've stored that somewhere else, cause it's, you know, it's just text, um, it's, it's regularly available and much more accessible. All right. Great. Now you apply this diagrams as code approach to several different diagram types and notations in your book. Can you give us a brief overview before we go into the technical details of how Mermaid works? Can you give us a brief overview, uh, which diagram types and notations did you choose, which are covered in your book? Sure. So I'll go over three because I, I cover a few more in the book, but mm -hmm. I think the, the three main ones that I use most, most commonly and the fine, the three I find most useful, um, in no particular order. The first one would be a sequence diagram. 
So this is how you model interactions between either it can be services or it can be kind of people, if you like. So people in like a business process, for example. And the way it works is you have essentially kind of nodes. So you'd have kind of you know, maybe two here and lines going between them. And it just shows the, the interactions between those things. So let's take um, if you're building, let's say, a service, uh, let's say an application that allows users to, to sign in and you want to model that sign in flow. You might have, you know, the front end that makes an API call to, to the back end with you know, the, the credentials for the user. And then the back end might respond with, you know, a 200 OK, for example, in, in the happy path. Um, and the sequence diagram allows you to model those, those flows um, in a way that's kind of very visual and very easy to, to understand. The, the second one would be the C4 model. Um, and that's written or created by Simon Brown. And it's a way to model your software architecture. Um, so it can be quite hard to model your software architecture sometimes or have describe it sometimes or you know, show it to other people, right? It can be really complicated. So it's a very nice way to get different views of your architecture. So the there's four different views in the C4 model, so that's where the C4 comes from. The, the first one, I'm going to cover two of them because I think the latter two are not quite as used as much, but the first one is called context, and it's a very, very high-level view of your architecture. So it's meant to be non-technical. It will just be systems and how they interact with each other. So it gets you a very good glance at what what each system is doing in the architecture. You can think of it like the responsibilities of each service in the architecture and the users that are using those services. And then the next view down would be container, which is described as the, the single deployable units. So if you had, let's say, uh, a backend service that's built using Rails and you had um, I don't know, a MongoDB database, those would be two containers. And then you would describe the interactions between those. Um, and then the other, the other two, you drill more down. So you go into like components, which are like namespaces or modules, and then you can go into classes. But you're then getting really, really into detail. So I don't normally do do those ones. Okay, great. So we have two sequence diagrams and C4 model, which itself is like a set of of um, abstractions and, and diagram types. And what's the third one that you want to discuss? So the last one would be the domain model diagram. Um, and that's that's kind of as it sounds really. Um, it's a way of describing the the problem domain that your your software is working in. So um, if we take this recording, for example, um, we're recording on a bit of software, and you might have you know participants might be something in your domain. You know after we've finished, you might have a recording that will be something in your domain. Um, you have speakers and and so forth in your domain. You have all these you know, domain entities, and it's just a way of documenting those, those, you know, what's in your domain in a, in a diagram and describing the relations between them. So is there, does each participant have many recordings or one recording and, and so forth, things like that. If I want to categorize those three notations or diagram types, um, sequence diagrams are defined in the UML. So it's like very formally defined, right? Um, C4 is more like a set of abstractions. Different notations are possible and uh, it's defined by Simon Brown. And um, the last one, the, the um, domain models, that's more like a free form, not really defined. There's no standard for that, right? That'd be correct, yeah. Okay, so that means that uh, Mermit, the tooling uh, that you describe in your book is able to do all of that. So it's a broad spectrum from uh, formally defined model languages to like free for modeling, everything is possible with that tooling. Would you agree with that? Yes. Um, I think the, it has a kind of base set of diagram types that it, it supports. So it, it doesn't have a, you know, a domain model diagram type, yeah. but it does have something called a flow chart. Mm -hmm. And the flow chart is kind of like the, the most generic diagram type you get in, in Mermaid. Um, so you can kind of do do whatever you like with it. So if you have a diagram that doesn't fit into the, the normal types, I would use a flowchart. So in, in the case of, um, in the book, I use flowchart for the C4 model and I use it for the domain model diagram. Mm -hmm. Mermaid is adding support for the C4 
diagram slowly um, into it. So it has like the native syntax. Um, yeah. So you, you could use that now. Um, it only supports, I think, one, the kind of highest level context diagram at the moment. Um, and it also uses the, I think it's plant UML notation. So it's, it's, a little, it's to me, it's a lot more complicated, complicated than normal mermaid because you have to learn a different notation, which is the plant UML notation. Um, and finally, the sequence diagram is natively supported. So that's kind of its own diagram type in mermaid. Um, with its own kind of syntax, but it's if you, if, if anyone's ever used you know UML, it's it basically uses the syntax for UML. Okay, great. So now we've started to touch on the topic of Mermaid itself. So from diagrams as code, we move now to one specific tooling um, to um, to create diagrams from code, and that is Mermaid. So. How does Mermaid work? Can you give us an overview of what is required in order to use it? Yeah. So you don't need, well, you need JavaScript. So it, it's, it's primarily written in, I think, JavaScript and, and TypeScript. So it has the kind of, I think it was the first one that I used that had, that was easy to run pretty much everywhere, right? Because JavaScript runs everywhere. It runs in your, um, in your browser. You can run it on the edge. You can run it on servers. You can, you can basically run it anywhere, right? Um, if you look at historically, some of the kind of perhaps problems with prior ones. So if you take the, the main one before, it probably was plant UML. Um, and that had all the kind of same diagram types that Mermaid has, but it was written in Java, which you know, Java's a fine language, but it, it doesn't run everywhere, right? You need to make sure Java's installed. You can't just run it in the browser. It, it absolutely doesn't run in the browser. So Mermaid kind of has this big selling point of that it's super easy to run wherever you want. And to explain kind of what it is, it's it's you know a tool for creating diagrams as code. Um, the documentation is really, really good. So you'd be able to go on there, look through all the diagram types, and you'd very quickly be able to create diagrams from examples reading the docs and create all these different types of, of diagram. And then it will take what you write um, and there's like a live editor, so you can do it live and it'll update it live. And then you can export um, images from that from the diagram if you want. Um, and then there are some other things you can do that are really kind of its big selling points. If I understand it correctly, Mermit defines a markup language, or you, call, you would call it a domain-specific language for describing the diagrams in, in form of code. And then there's a tooling that's also called Mermaid to uh, create the actual visual diagrams out of that code. So I could probably write Mermaid diagrams in my favorite text editor and then just apply the tools and have them generate the diagrams. Is that correct? Yeah. So the Mermaid kind of library on, on GitHub has many different kind of parts to it. Um, and one of them would be, for example, like a CLI tool. So you can, if you want to, you could... Um, you know, write a diagram in Mermaid and then use the CLI on your you know, command line to, to generate the images. Um, like I said, there's a, there's a live editor that, again, is part of the Mermaid package. It's all, it's all kind of open source. So there is a live editor, so I can, that's maybe nice for actually creating the diagrams or the first versions maybe, so I can see like live, if I enter this line of code, this is how it's going to be rendered, um, which is nice for modeler, but um, once I have the actual DSL file, I could like integrate generation of documentation into my build process because there are CLI tools available. Is that correct? Yeah, you definitely could. Um, okay. The other kind of big selling point that I would say, and probably I, it's probably the main reason I started using it, um, is a lot of engineers these days they use GitHub or GitLab, for example. Um, they're probably the main two kind of version control um, providers, and while being able to do it with the CLI is nice, doing it in the live editor is nice. If you export an image out of these tools, which you could do with draw.io, right? You still then, and you want to store it in version control. Let's say you want to put your architecture diagrams in your, in your readme or in your repository with your code, right? Which is a really nice place to put your diagrams that relate to your code. So you might put your domain model in there. You might put your architecture diagram, your C4 model in there. Now, if you put an image in there, that's fine. That's, that's better than having nothing at all. But what will happen, like I said earlier, is if, if you leave and you create that diagram, 
um, I have to try and find that file. And if I can't find that file, because you probably didn't submit it to, uh, sorry, commit it to version control, I'm not, I have to either redraw the diagram if I want to update it, which could take ages, um, or probably more likely, I can't be bothered because I can't find this diagram to recreate it. So with GitHub, GitLab, some others, you can basically put, take the mermaid markup, so the simple markup, put it in, in GitHub in, you know, in code tags with, with mermaid. So the three back ticks with mermaid. And then when that markdown file is, is viewed on, on GitHub in the browser or GitLab, it will, it will render that diagram for you with no work. So then you have your, your single source of truth for your diagram is stored in your, in your code repository. And whenever one, anyone wants to view it, it will, it will render it for you without any kind of any work whatsoever. So that sort of integration is, uh, as you said, it's a, it's a big selling point. But uh, speaking of selling, you said open source. So I don't need to buy Mermaid, right? Nope. It's, it's all open source. So um, anyone can contribute. There is kind of a, there's a product they sell on the side, basically the people that kind of wrote it for you to kind of store your diagrams if you want. But you know, the, the main primary library is all, is all open source and anyone can contribute, anyone can use it. Um, and it's, it's got beyond GitLab and GitHub, you know, tools that you probably use like Jira, Notion, Trello, many, many others. They all have kind of mermaid plugins, um, that you can use. Yeah. That's cool. So everybody is free to build their own plugins or their own tooling using the Mermit DSL. And then every Mermit diagram uh, would also work with that plugin or that tooling that you've built on your own, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's good. Do you know how long a Mermit has been around? I'm asking because, you know, sometimes diagrams or notations change, get extended. Maybe it's not compatible always. So do you have any experience? Do the old diagrams created with earlier versions still work? Um, how is that? So, so far, I've not had a diagram of mine break. So I think they're very careful to ensure backwards compatibility. Um, I think especially since they've been on, you know, GitHub, for example, I think it would be a bad look if they suddenly broke, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I don't know how many diagrams have been created on GitHub by. I assume it's very, very high. Um, and like I said, it, it's a big selling point, I think, is the, is the GitHub and GitLab integration. So I think if they, they would want to look after that integration, I think. Um, they, they do add new ones. So like I said, they're, they're constantly adding um, new diagram types. So besides kind of, The ones I talked about, you get, you know, class diagrams for, you know, modeling, modeling your code. You can even do things like, you know, Gantt charts if you want to structure your kind of releases or something like that. They have kind of mind maps for like ideation and they're adding kind of new ones, new ones all the time. Um, in terms of how long it's been around, I can't remember when it was released. I don't think it's not like, it's definitely not like old, old. I would say it's probably been around for, I think about five years, but. I wouldn't want to be quoted on it, but um, it's yeah, it's it's still relatively relatively new, um, and it does it does have a very active kind of contributor base on um, on GitHub, so it, it is very well maintained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that plant UML has been around for a bit longer, so that's another uh, diagrams as code approach that you've mentioned earlier. It's own uh, its own language and its own tooling. Um, That's one I've used before. Another one uh, that uh, another tooling, another um, diagramming language that I've used before for the C4 model is Structure Riser, um, the tooling by Simon Brown. Um, I'm sure there are other toolings out there that I haven't used before. Um, do you want to compare them a little bit with, with Mermaid? So you brought up a point already with the GitHub integration. So maybe that's a the selling point as you called it for mermaid but uh, maybe you can expand on that a little bit yeah sure i would i would say that yeah the different differentiator is definitely the kind of the fact that it's available on github it's its biggest selling point for sure but besides that i think earlier on i talked about how you know plant your is written in in java which makes yeah. it you can't just run it anywhere right the setup is not easy if you um you know you I, you'll find things online for you know editing plant your but if you actually want to kind of it locally, for example, in your in your IDE. Um, there are probably plugins for it, but it's going to be more annoying. You have to install Java, so forth. With Mermaid, you don't have to do that. 
Um, the DSLs, like if you'd used Plan UML, for example, and you, you haven't heard of Mermaid before, and you're interested to try Mermaid, if you want, if you want to migrate, the, the syntax is basically identical because it's, it's UML syntax. So it's for the, at least for the most part for Mermaid. So you'd probably be able to take all your diagrams written in, in Plan UML um, and just put them in Mermaid and maybe a few minor tweaks and everything would just kind of work. So then you get the benefits of Mermaid without you know, any pain of migration, really. Um, Structurizer is specifically made for the, the C4 model and it has its own kind of DSL that is specific to that. Um, I've used it a little bit. Um, I think it's, it's, it's slightly different because it's, it's a modeling tool, right? So you, if you were creating a backend service that was called, I don't know, I'm going to call it the backend because I'm terrible at thinking of names like most engineers. Um, in the, in the structurizer DSL, you would define, you know, the backend service and you, you know, you might say it's a Ruby on Rails service and you'd find that once and then anywhere you use it, you just kind of reference that model because you've made that model for your um, for that thing. With Mermaid, it's just a, it's a simple DSL, right? So you'd have to maybe, if you were doing two versions of the C4 model that I talked about, the content and the container, you would have duplication between the two. And if you want to change the name of one thing in all of them, you'd have to go f- change it all and so forth. Yeah. However, if you if you wanted to model, because modeling is, is slightly different, if you wanted to use that model as I spoke about, you can do it in Structurizer, and then you can act, you can export it to a bunch of different um, languages. So you can export it to Mermaid, you can export it to Plant UML. I think it does D3 these days. It, it does all sorts. So while it is its own DSL and it's very specific to the C4 model, you can still get Mermaid, you know, from that tool if you if you wanted to then put it in version control, for example. Hmm. Okay, that's good. And if you have a Diagrams as code approach, like with Mermaid, refactoring doesn't sound as scary anymore. Renaming stuff is a lot easier if you have it in your in your IDE, maybe some support there. Uh, you check it into your repository and and everything is fine. And you know that it still works, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and because it's, you know, if you're using GitHub, for example, you could, you know, when you raise the PR, you just click you know, view file and you'll see it all looks, it looks fine. Um, and one of the other kind of you know, it's in me and you were working on improving or changing our domain model that we work on together. Yeah. Um, you might raise a pull request, but if you were doing, you know, draw.io or something where the format is completely unreadable or just an image, you can't really, it's really hard to diff an image, right? You can, you can look at it, but if it's quite big, it, it can be hard to see the, the nuance in it. Whereas with Mermaid, because it's just text, you would easily see what I changed. So if, if, you know, like you just said, if you rename something, and maybe I, I don't know, I missed one or something. You would be able to easily be able to see in the diff that I missed it, most likely anyway, because it's just it's just text, but used to kind of reviewing diffs in that way, right? So yeah, it's really easy to. Now, as I said, I've used a little bit of plant UML and structurizer before, so I found it easy to transition to a mermaid. Um I had actually never tried Mermaid before I read the book. So um, your book does a very nice job in guiding readers step by step to applying Mermaid, you know, starting really simple. You have your first diagram, like with, I don't know, three or five lines of, of, of code and then expand on that. And then you go through the different notations um, that you've that you described. And um, we see like, okay, um, um, you know, uh, some have like their own diagram, type like native support and others use a more general one and then you you adapt it to your needs so um, that is really easy to follow in your book and i would assume that also um, people who have never used a diagrams as code approach before uh, will have an easy time getting starting with with moment if they um, read your book and and follow the examples in there yeah i think so that's the the general feedback i've had i think especially because engineers as you know they used to write complicated code and you know simple text-based market is pretty easy for anyone to, to grasp. So yeah, I think it's it's pretty easy to get up to speed with. Yeah. So I'm curious, when, why did you decide uh, to write a book about uh, Mermaid and diagrams as, as code? There's a quite good documentation also online um, um, regarding the, the tooling. So why the book? Um, what what, what um, got you there to, 
to make this decision. It's a lot of effort to write a book. It is. I think, I think many years ago, I remember, I think, I guess everyone that does diagrams maybe has their kind of epiphany moment where they kind of realize the kind of power of a diagram. I'm sure you have your own. Um, and I hadn't written any diagrams before. I didn't know what UML was, um, but I was trying to explain things at work and no one was getting it. Um, and I maybe couldn't even explain it that well myself, which is probably why they weren't, weren't getting it, but I was kind of just throwing kind of words at them, if you like. And I drew a very bad diagram. You know, it wouldn't have been based on any kind of diagram I knew because I didn't, I didn't know anything. Um, but then everyone suddenly got it and I got it better and I could explain it better. So at that point, and this was many, many years ago, I could kind of see the power of, of diagrams. And then I started kind of, I think, I don't remember why I saw Mermaid the first time, but I kind of saw it um, and thought, oh, wow, this is kind of, this is really cool. And I started playing around with it. And I had a look at the at diagramming books. I was curious if there was a book on Mermaid, for example. Um, and even just looking at diagramming books, there hadn't been one written for like 15 or 20 years, something ridiculous like that. The last one, I don't know, I think it was like Uncle Bob or someone wrote one a long time, a long time ago. All about kind of UML, for example, and things have moved forward a long, um, a long way since since that time. So I thought, you know, there's a lot of things, lots of things have changed. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll I'll write a book. You know, it seems like there's a gap for that for more modern, newer engineers. They're probably not going to want to read a book about UML because while UML is is very good, it has a bit of a kind of old school reputation. I would say, you know, I don't think it's it's rare you kind of work with someone and they kind of whip out a UML diagram these days, right? But at least with Mermaid, it makes it seem a little kind of more cool, a bit more kind of easier to use. You haven't got to draw. It's a bit of a, it's an easier sell, if you like, is probably why, why I wrote the book. And just to kind of bring it up to modern, modern speed, I guess. My takeaway here is that Mermaid makes UML look cool again. There you go. You could say that. <laughs> okay. But actually it's about more than, than uh, UML or your book is about more than UML. And this is something that I think is a, a, a benefit over just reading online documentation that is provided for the tooling because you have an, an opinion on what diagrams and what notations to use and when to use them. So you made a, a conscious choice which uh, diagram types to include in your book and describe them with Mermaid. So maybe let's go back from the concrete tooling with Mermaid a little bit to more to the topic of diagramming and and um, modeling in general. So you had the sequence diagram, you had the, the C4 model for architecture and the, and the um, domain uh, model. Why these and, and, not, and not some other, why not BPNN or whatever? So I think when I, when I wrote the book, um, and this partly comes from the publisher, Pragmatic. They like it to be kind of hands-on and, you know, as you go through the book, you it should model kind of real-world things and there should be kind of activities for people to do because people, if you if you kind of read a book and don't do anything, it's kind of, you don't learn as much if, if, if you know, there's activities for you to do during the book. Um, and then if you go and do them, it kind of reinforces that learning. So that's their general approach. Um, and I'd never written a book before, so I was very happy for all their kind of guidance and, and, and their direction. But as you kind of go through the book, I kind of tried to make it like you would, like you would do your, your day job if you were building, um, a brand new, a brand new service and you'd go through different stages, right? So you might, you know, a business requirement comes up for you to do this thing and you realize, you know, maybe you're starting to work in a, in a brand new domain. So, you know, the first thing you're going to need to do is understand the domain with a domain model diagram. So the, the first chapter is on domain modeling and writing a domain model. You then might want to talk about the sequence flows, you know, understand the interactions that you have um, going on in your system. So that could be people or services and kind of understand a very high level because sequence diagrams are super high level the interactions and how your system is going to talk to your current existing systems, for example, and then see how that plays in. Um, and then again, you might then design, define your architecture with the, with the C4 model, for example. And then I think it goes into things like you might decide how you want to structure your code base. So you might reach for class diagrams and you don't need to model, you know, all of the classes that you're ever going to write because that's going to take a very long time. But you might just kind of, play around with how you want to kind of organize your code with, with a class diagram. And similarly, you can also use class diagrams for refactoring. So, you know, if you jumped forward six months, you might have a need to do some refactoring. 
you're going to have maybe you know, loads of classes at play and maybe it's becoming a little bit you know tricky. Maybe maybe you made a bit of a mess somewhere and you just want to understand how everything fits together. So you draw a class diagram and you can kind of very quickly and easily rearrange them with Mermaid. So that's it's one of its, you know, another one of the selling points is it's, it's, you can iterate really quickly. So if you if you were doing a domain model and you wanted to change, I don't know, you wanted to try out different names or different relationships, you could do that in, you know, a few minutes versus if someone, if you're in a meeting with someone and have got to draw the boxes and move them all around, it's going to be really painful, both for the person and everyone watching while they move these things around versus you can quickly iterate on with things with Mermaid. Cool. Before you said you researched um, other and also older uh, books on, on this topic of, of diagramming and modeling, uh, some even like 20 years old. Um, if we were now in 20 years from now and, and some, some, uh, new developer, uh, was, was, um, you know, exploring what the forefathers wrote 20 years ago, um, and they would discover your book. I believe that I don't know if Mervit will still be around in 20 years, or maybe it's a completely different version. And, you know, the, 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 the DSL code uh, might not be valid anymore. But nevertheless, I would argue that your book would still have value um, because it's not just about Mermaid. Um, it's about those diagramming techniques and also when to apply them. So there's some, some um, advice there, even if you don't use um, Mermaid itself. Um, maybe some some other tooling. Yes, the the listings of code, of course, they only make sense with Mermaid. But uh, there's some more general um, advice there for how to use diagramming in order to build better software. So that's what I really like about your book. Thank you very much. And maybe if you if you jump forward to those those 20 years in the future and what things might look like, I think one thing that's starting to happen it hasn't kind of quite got there yet is it would be really cool if you could draw these diagrams. And you could turn those diagrams into real things. So this is starting to happen a little bit. I can't remember the name of the tool. It's escaping me now. But there's one way you can draw things on like AWS using their stuff. And it will take that diagram and deploy it in AWS. Um, mm. I, I saw it kind of the other day. Um, and obviously these days, let's say you, you, know, you like the idea of Mermaid, but you don't want to learn the syntax. Everyone these days knows about ChatGPT. Um, and ChatGPT is an expert on Mermaid. So it can, you can, you know, the other day, literally yesterday, um, I was working on something with, with just some friends, just on a side project, and we were look, talking about you know how you design the database, um, and that's one of the diagram types I actually forgot to mention was you can actually use an entity relationship diagram to model your kind of database using Mermaid. That's the diagram type, and we were kind of just talking about it out loud, and one of the guys, you know, he he couldn't quite grasp what we were what we got to because we now had like seven, eight, nine tables. Um, so he, he drew out on, on paper, but I was like, well, we could just, we could just draw it with mermaid. And I basically just told, you know, chat GPT. So here are the tables, here are the relations. And it, you know, in 30 seconds, I had a, a diagram that I'd not even had to learn or draw anything from mermaid. It just, it did it for me. So I think that's, it's really powerful. So that's one way from, you know, a, a description to a formal architecture diagram, but he also said, uh, you know, from a, from a diagram to running software. So maybe we'll see a rebirth of um, model-driven architecture or model-driven development. So that was, in my opinion, like an uh, interesting approach like 20 years ago, but never really, um, at least not in, in, in general purpose um, software development, uh, never really um, kept the promises that were made with that. But yeah, and maybe with the new tooling and and AI, um, it deserves a second chance. Who knows? So I'll see. I'll see, I'll see a new book um, <laughs> on the horizon by Ashley Peacock. Perhaps. Okay, Ashley. Um, is there anything else that you want to to mention that we haven't um, discussed yet? No, I don't think so. I think if you're if you're interested in the topic, if you're interested in the book, it's available you know, on Amazon. Creating software with modern diagramming techniques. You can you can go get it today. I hope you enjoy my night. Great. I and enjoyed thank you. talking to you, enjoyed your book. And yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to your next one. Thank you. Thank you for the, you know, thanks for doing this with me. I really enjoyed talking to you about it. Thank you. Sure, it was my pleasure. So that was our episode um, on the book 
Creating software with modern diagramming techniques built better software with Mermaid by Ashley Peacock. See you for the next episode of the GoTo Book Club. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code Book Club. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more. Hey.